Yeah. All right, so I guess we'll uh, we'll get started again. Uh, moving on with hypothesis testing, confidence intervals, all of that stuff. Are we feeling okay with the stuff from uh, chapters 20, 21, hypothesis tests for? One? We didn't have anything. To I did not assign homework better. from chapter 21. Um, I'll, I'll assign a few problems from there this weekend. But, uh, but I asked uh, Aroma Lynn to go over some uh, hypothesis test stuff in section, so I'm hoping we're feeling okay regarding the process there, because uh, it's just going to be more of the same, but for different, uh, different applications and different processes, okay? So, so far what you have learned you have learned um, hypothesis tests and confidence intervals uh, for one categorical variable, all right? One categorical variable with one sample. Okay. And so uh, the book calls it the one sample proportion confidence interval, or Z interval, and, or I'm sorry, one proportion Z interval and one proportion Z test, okay? <coughs> so you observe one sample, and based on that one sample, what can we say about the population. That's what we've covered so far. Okay, so today, uh, this is chapter 22. We're still dealing with a categorical variable. But now we have two samples. Okay, and we're making comparisons between these two samples. So we're going to learn the two-proportion z-test and the two-proportion z-interval. Okay. They're similar, but also different. <laughs> okay, so the idea here is now, um, you know, we have sample one, and from sample one we observe p hat one, sample two, we have p hat two. So it could be, um, you know, what proportion, so sample one could be males, and it could be what proportion of males have blonde hair. Now we can go over to sample two and say sample two is females, and we ask what proportion have blonde hair? <coughs> so when we do a Z test, we will be testing the hypotheses that the respective populations have the same proportion. That the proportion of uh, men in the population with blonde hair is equal to the proportion of women in the population with blonde hair. That would be what we do for the Z test. The Z interval says, well, let's not make any assumptions about the population. Let's just look at what the data says and see what the data says about the populations. Okay. So just like we had confidence intervals and hypothesis tests for one, uh, one sample or one proportion, we can do the same with two. So I don't know if we care which one we do first, but uh, we'll, 
do the, uh, I guess we'll do the hypothesis test first, okay? Maybe the book does the uh, confidence interval first, but it doesn't matter. Okay. So we have sample one, sample two. Each one gives us a proportion. But, uh, so we'll do a, a hypothesis test. <coughs> hypothesis test. Again, we have two samples, categorical variable. So we call this the two proportion z test. The null hypothesis is that the respective populations have the same proportion. Okay, so in our illustration, sample one comes from population one. And population one, large entity, has proportion P1. <coughs> and sample two comes from population two. And population two has proportion P2. So the null hypothesis over here, symbolically, is that P1 is equal to P2. That's what we are saying in the null hypothesis. Sometimes we will rewrite this, and these are interchangeable, and we will say that the difference between P1 and P2 is zero, that there is no difference. These two statements are identical. The alternative, then, will be that the proportions are different, or that, so the alternative hypothesis could be P1 does not equal P2, or P1 is greater than P2, or P1 is less than P2, depending on how the uh, question is phrased. And again, the equivalent in this al alternate form I can write them this way. Okay. Okay, so let's say um, okay, so for our silly example, do uh, men and women have the same proportion of blonde hair? Uh, that would be our null hypothesis is that they have the same proportion. And should our alternative be non-directional or directional or what? Non-directional. I would, I would venture to say uh, we could even go directional, but we can go non-directional, okay? So we'll, we'll use a non-directional alternative, okay? So we will use, uh, the null hypothesis will be that P1 minus P2 equals zero, and then the alternative will be that P1 minus P2, oops, is not equal to zero. And, uh, and this will be, for, uh, sample one will be the males, and sample two will be females. Okay, so uh, let's say in our data, what we observe is uh, we take a survey of 200 men. How many do you think have blonde hair? No idea. 30. Okay, and then uh, so this will be N1 and X1, and then N2 and X2. Let's say we surveyed uh, 250 females and uh, 
55. I have blonde hair. Make enough numbers, okay? Okay. So what we see is that P1 hat, the proportion, sample proportion, would be 30 over 200, and we get 15%. And for the women, we get 22%. So if the null hypothesis were true, we would expect our sample proportions to be equal. We would expect that there would be no difference between our sample proportions. So if H0 true, we expect P1 hat minus P2 hat to be equal to 0. But what we observe P1 hat minus P2 hat is 0.15 minus 0.22. We get negative 0 0.07. <coughs> is negative 0 0.07 a big deal or not? Is this a significant difference or not? That's what we're asking. The idea here is we are creating a sampling distribution for the quantity p1 hat minus p2 hat. Okay. Under the null hypothesis, we expect that difference p1 hat minus p2 hat to be close to zero. And what we observe is that we're at negative point zero seven. All right, so what matters now is the standard error, okay, or the standard deviation of our sampling distribution. So I think it'll just be easiest if I just tell you the formula to use rather than trying to uh, explain where it's coming from, okay? So this is... Uh, P hat Q hat over N1 plus P hat Q hat over N2, where, notice there's no ones here, P hat is equal to uh, the total successes over the total observations. Total quote success over total observed. So in our case, p hat would be the total number of people with blonde hair that we observe. So that would be 30 plus 55 divided by total number of observations, 200 plus 250. So I have 85 divided by 450. And I get 0.188, so I'll say 0.1889. That is my p hat. Okay, and so at this point it's just a matter of sticking it into formula. Q hat being 1 minus p hat. So what's, what is this, 8111? <coughs> so. so now I just put 
times this out, and I do that times that. And I'm getting 0 0.0371. Can someone verify that? I will just pretend like you guys tried. <laughs> okay. So what we um, so we're at negative point oh seven. So our observed difference you know point one five minus point two two is equal to negative point oh seven. So we're gonna get a z score. So now that we have this standard error, we can use that to get a z score. So our z, I can do is a negative 0.07, or I can write 0.15 minus 0.22 over the standard error. So I get negative 0.07 divided by 0.0371. And what do I get when I do that? 1.0371. Negative 1.89. All right. Normal table, I look up negative 1.89 and I get the area in my tail. 1.89 gives me 0 0.0294. That's my tail area. Now we decided to go with a non-directional alternative. I think we should have gone directional, but non-directional alternative. So we've got to double this. And we would see 0 0.0294 over here. So the total area in our tails times 0 0.0294 gives me point oh I cannot do this point zero five eight eight this would be my p value okay. yes why did I double because my alternative hypothesis is, has a not equal sign, so this means I have a non-directional or two-sided test. Okay, but if it's a two-sided test, then you only Yes, that's correct. So if it's larger than zero, which one? Then you would, take, you would go here and go to the right, okay. and it would be like 90-something percent. Okay. Does this process sit okay? So it's only when, when it's greater than or less than that you only use one sign? Yes, so if the alternative hypothesis has a not equal sign, you're going to use both tails. You're going to take this tail area and multiply it by 2. If it has a less than sign, P1 minus P2 is less than 0, you take the cutoff and you go to the left. If it is, has a greater than sign, you take the cutoff and you go to the right. Ideally, if it's a less than sign, you're going to be on the negative side, so the area to the left is less than 0.5. And if it's greater than zero, you're hoping to be on the positive side so that your area is small. So our p-value is 0 0.0588.
So if we used alpha to be 5%, what would we conclude? So if our significance level alpha is 0.05 and our p-value is 0.0588, we decide we decide not to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, That's very different from saying the null hypothesis is true. We, we say we do not have evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. Do not write we accept the null hypothesis or that the null hypothesis is true. And that's because we always use evidence, our data, to support the alternative. And we can either we either have enough data to support the alternative and reject the null, or we don't have enough evidence to support the alternative. Or we don't and we don't have enough evidence to reject the null. Yes? So you said we can't write that we accept it? Yeah, do not write that we accept the null. Okay? Because all this is saying is that so you surveyed 200 males and 200 females, and you found that 15% of the males had blonde hair and 22% of the females had blonde hair. Does that mean that males and females have the same proportion of blonde hair? No. All it says is that this is not enough evidence for us to decide that males and females have different proportions of blonde hair. Okay? And I think if you took a large enough sample, you would find that there are more females with blonde hair than males. Just, yes? Sometimes when the p-value is really close to 0 0.05, uh -huh. um, we reject the... Uh, you, you can, you can. If, if you decide, so if you specify alpha to be 0.05, it just has to be, is this bigger or smaller? Okay? But you could say, I want to use alpha equal to 7%, and that's totally val valid. And you just say, okay, well, in that case, my p-value is less than 7%, so I reject the null hypothesis. Okay. It's just that if you choose a larger alpha, you have a larger risk of a type 1 error. Yes? Will any questions you ask us specify the alpha, or will we have that opportunity to pick ourselves? Um, so, in... Uh, I guess on test things, I should provide an alpha to you, okay, so there's no ambiguity. But I might give you a, present you a problem and say, in this case, would we choose, if we could choose our alpha, would we choose a large alpha or a small alpha? Okay, and we covered that uh, on Wednesday's lecture, when we, when, uh, if type 1 error or type 2 error is preferred. Okay, yes? Um, what happens if you have a value that's above, let's say, 90%. Then you do not reject the null hypothesis. So it still doesn't mean the null hypothesis is true. Right? It does not mean that the null hypothesis is true. So, so f okay, here's a silly example, all right? Um, okay, so one of the, uh, if you watch basketball, Chris Paul plays for the Los Angeles Clippers. He's a good uh, free throw shooter. He's a good, good point guard in general. All right, uh, and he shoots uh, free throws at a you know ninety percent rate. Okay. All right. So let's say um, let's say I go to the uh, free throw line and I take two shots and they both go in. Okay. So my uh, my free throw shooting rate for my two shots is 100%, okay? Does that make me a better basketball player in terms of free throw percentage than Chris Paul? No, of course not, okay? I could have just gotten lucky with my two shots, or, you know, maybe I'm half decent, but um, all we saw was that uh, I've taken two, two shots, okay? Or does it even mean that I'm equally good? No, okay? All we've seen is just two, uh, two shots, and so that's not enough sample to um, even prove that our percentage rates are the same, okay? 
it's not enough to reject that, but it, it certainly is not going to prove that I'm just as good. Okay, so maybe based on two, me taking two shots and making both of them, that neither is enough evidence to either say you are that much worse or that uh, or equally good or any better than um, than Chris Paul. We would need to gather more data. Okay, and so something like this. We've looked at 450 people. Maybe at the end of the day, we don't have enough evidence to say there's a difference. But it's certainly not enough evidence to say that they're the same. And actually, what is the only way we could say that P1 and P2 are the same? We would have to observe the proportions in the population, OK? And the whole idea of statistics is that we can't observe the population, okay? And so we will never actually know the true value of P1 and the true value of P2. So we will never actually be able to say that P1 and P2 are the same unless we observe the entire populations. So until we observe the entire populations, all we can say is that I have a bunch of data and I either have enough reason to believe that they're different, or I don't have enough reason to believe that they're different. And that's, uh, I guess that's the limiting and maybe slightly frustrating part of statistics is that you can never prove that the null hypothesis is true. All you can do is gather data and say, I have reason to reject the null, or I don't have reason to reject the null. And that's how we set up our court systems in terms of criminal criminal defense, okay, we always go in, we say uh, the defendant is presumed innocent until proven guilty, okay, and so either there's enough evidence presented to convince the jury that the defendant is guilty, okay, but if there's not enough evidence, then the jury finds the defendant not guilty. Notice that the jury never says we find the defendant innocent, okay, we say the jury, uh, jury finds the defendant not guilty. That means there was not enough evidence to prove that the person was guilty. It doesn't prove that the person is innocent. Um, and the way our court system is set up, it's, uh, it's not set up so that we're trying to prove innocence. We're either trying to prove guilt or we don't have enough evidence to prove guilt. Alright, okay, so is that okay? So we our p-value is larger than 0.05, and we say we don't have enough evidence to reject the null. Okay, so that was a hypothesis test. Let's say we decide to create a confidence interval. Okay. So the confidence interval is similar, except the way we do our standard error is different. Okay, And a lot of times, it doesn't make a huge difference but sometimes it does, okay? So let's say we're using the same data here. We look, took a sample of males and a sample of females and we asked, do you have blonde hair? And this is the data that we pulled up. Okay, so we still have P1 hat and P2 hat. So for a confidence interval, The center of our confidence interval is going to be P1 hat minus P2 hat. And it's going to be plus or minus Z star times the standard error. And the standard error here is P1 hat Q1 hat over N1 plus P2 hat Q2 hat over N2. So there's a whole bunch of standard error formulas and all of this. Um, I think in the inside back cover of your textbook, there's a nice handy little chart here that kind of summarizes a bunch of the different uh, standard error formulas that you have to know. And so it's nicely organized and arranged. So I would say at least uh, take a look at that and copy the relevant sections onto you, your test note sheets and things like that. This is a confidence interval for 
P1 minus P2. So we are looking at the difference in percentages in the populations. Okay, so let's uh, go through this. Let's make a 95% confidence interval. So for a 95% confidence interval, what will my Z star be? 1.96, okay? That's, 1.96 is a good number to know, okay? 95% Z star, 1.96. It all changes when we go into means and use t's and things like that, but for now, z, 1.96. Okay, and the standard error, now it's just plugging in the numbers again. 0.15 times 0.85 over 200 plus 0.22 times 0.78 over 250. So my value ends up slightly different. Point oh three six four. <clears throat> Most of the times, the difference between this and the other one are pretty small, as is the case here. Okay, so plugging all of this in, I do P1 hat minus P2 hat. plus or minus 1.96 times 0 0.0364 and I get negative 0 0.07 plus or minus 0 0.071 so I get negative 1412.001 or negative 14.1% to positive 0.1%. So what does this mean? I would say I am 95% confident that um, the percentage of males again in the population is between 14.1 percentage points lower fourteen point one percentage points lower uh, and point one percentage points higher And the percentage of females with blonde hair. I should say males in the population, sorry, with blonde hair. I left that out. Does that statement make sense? So we're asking about what's the uh, difference in percentages of males with blonde hair and females with blonde hair. And our confidence interval says that 
the percentage of males with blonde hair is between 14 percentage points lower and basically one-tenth of a percentage point higher than the uh, percentage of females with blonde hair. Uh, and in this case, because zero is technically inside the interval, what does we would say we do not have evidence that there is a difference between um, the percentages of males and females. Okay, one could argue that because this is so close to not being past zero, so if you're looking at the number line, right, zero is here, and you're at your interval basically goes from negative 14 to just over here. Your interval covers from here to here. One might say that we're so close to missing zero that we could just say we've got evidence that there's fewer uh, males with blonde hair than, than females. But the, gen the rule is, general rule is that if zero is in between the ends of the interval, which it is here because we got a negative side here and a positive side over here. If zero is within your interval, you do not have evidence that there's a difference in the percentages. So if zero is within the interval, okay, so that means one side of the interval is negative and the other side of the interval is positive. If zero is within the interval, we do not have evidence that there is a difference. Difference between the percentages in the population. Okay, so let's try, let me just check my time, okay, let's try an example here. Or, uh, well, maybe I should mention conditions again. So in all of these uh, hypothesis tests and confidence intervals, we, there is an underlying assumption that the sampling distribution comes from, is a, is a normal distribution, okay, and those require that assumptions and conditions are met. Okay, so we have the same assumptions and conditions as we did before. And what were those? Samples are randomly selected or random and independent. The sample size is not too big, so it's less than 10% of the population. Sample size is not too small, so that n times p and n times q are both bigger than 10. Okay, in this case, we have two samples. So that applies for both samples, okay? And then because there's two samples, there's one more condition. And that is the two samples are selected independently. So that it's not that you are taking, uh, I don't know, when you're selecting males and females, you're not selecting a uh, husband and wife or spouses or things like that, okay, or brothers and sisters. You're, you're selecting the males independently, you're selecting the females independently, there's no connection between them. Okay. Uh, but the other conditions still hold. Other conditions still re 
still need to be met. Random um, sample not too big. Well, we call that the 10% condition. Sample not too small. Book calls that the success failure condition. All right, we'll do a silly example, or we kind of already know the answer. But we'll say, is, uh, is there an association between the length of someone's hair and the person's gender? Okay, so is there a relationship between gender Hair length. All right, and so technically, hair length could be numeric. We could measure how long is your strand of hair, and that could be a numeric variable. But in this case, we're just going to uh, make it categorical, and we'll just say people have to self-report and say, "I have short hair" or "I have long hair." Okay, so this will just be self-reported short or long, and then gender, <coughs> self-report, male or female. Okay, and so we, uh, we gather data, and it looks like this. Interesting article. I'm not. This is, never mind. Okay. <laughs> Just regarding gender and uh, uh, Wellesley College. It's a girls' school, but then you know, there's a a growing, still a much minority, but growing population of trans males at the school who entered as women, undergone uh, gender changes. So. Interesting, right? But when you're in all girls school, what, what do you do about that? So, uh, New York Times, you should uh, check it out if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, so let's just uh, keep our numbers simple. Let's say we had a thousand people, um, surveyed 400 males, 600 females. Um, let's say 40 of the males have <laughs> long hair which means 360 of the males had short hair, and let's say 480 females had short hair. No, 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 that's not right. Um, 120 females had short hair, and 480 females had long hair. Okay, so that leaves me with 480 and 520. I don't know what to do. All right. Uh, okay, so let's make a confidence interval. Ninety-five percent CI for P one minus P two. Okay, and so we'll just, for the sake of clarity, we'll just call this group one, and group two will be the females. So what is P1 hat? P1 hat is the proportion of males, um, uh, and I guess we have to decide whether to go with short hair or long hair. Okay. 
So we'll say a P1 hat will be the proportion of males with short hair. So we'll do 360 over 400 and we get 0.9. And then P2 hat will be the proportion of females with short hair. So that will be 120 over 600 and we have 0.2. That's, that's too bad. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we have P1 hat minus P2 hat plus or minus Z star times our standard error, which is this annoyingly large formula. It, you know, these things are unfortunate and there's just nothing we can do. All right, you just, that's, sometimes that's life, right? You want to... Go to the DMV, you gotta wait a long time. You're making an appointment, maybe it's only 20 minutes that time.